This Georgia Department of Education screencast is intended for teachers of fourth grade social studies to aid in the teaching of the Georgia Standards of Excellence. In this screencast, we will be taking a detailed look at the three major battles of the American Revolution our standard requires, specifically Lexington and Concord, Saratoga, and Yorktown, but through the lens of strategies that use the physical geography of the battle site to aid the respective armies, British and American, in their quest for victory. Our students should already be familiar with how humans use the physical environment around them to their benefit from their third grade studies of American Indians. Each of the tribes they studied had different cultural characteristics that were unique and were the result of the environments they lived in. For example, American Indian tribes that lived in the forested regions of the Northeast tended to live in longhouses built from wood, whereas tribes of the Great Plains lived in teepees made from buffalo skin and those of the southwestern desert lived in houses made of mud because those were the physical resources that were available to them. Similarly, the opposing armies of the American Revolution attempted to use the physical resources available to them at the battle sites to give them an advantage over their enemy. At the outset, it may be helpful for students to understand that the British were used to fighting in a type of geography that allowed for tight formations in which the soldiers would stand and fire a volley of shots into the approaching enemy, and that it was considered honorable to stand bravely and firmly in a brightly colored uniform. The gentler, more softly rolling terrain of much of Europe lent itself to this practice. The Americans, on the other hand, had grown quite used to fighting American Indians in our much wilder and rugged terrain and the tactics needed to be successful in this type of geography, which we learned from the American Indians, was very different. Rather than noble, it seemed foolish to stand or march fully exposed on an open road, and so we quickly took to using the ravines, hills, trees, rocks, and the like to hide behind and to attack our enemy. And so even before the first shot of the American Revolution was fired on the green at Lexington, the colonists had already learned to take advantage of the rougher geography of our home turf and the fact that Americans tended to spread out a bit more than the British. You see, the British had the plan to capture Samuel Adams and John Hancock in Concord, as well as destroy some munitions being stored there. But Concord is 20 miles outside of Boston, where the troops were deployed. Now, being foot soldiers by and large, the only way to get there was to walk, and walking 20 miles on foot takes some time. Time that Paul Revere and the other midnight riders took advantage of to travel on horseback throughout the country to warn the local volunteer Minutemen to begin preparing and gathering. Revere easily made it to Lexington in time to warn Adams and Hancock, despite having been captured and detained by a British patrol. One of his companions, Dr. Prescott, was able to make it to Concord with enough time for the Concord militia to hide most of the munitions the British were seeking. The very existence of the Minutemen, a volunteer militia that could be ready to defend the village at a moment's notice, is the result of the villages being so spread out. Colonists could not rely on forces from the major towns to defend them and so develop these militias. The colonists knew the land well and in Concord took advantage of the higher ground hidden from the approaching British to wait for more militiamen to arrive from neighboring villages. The British, however, took advantage of the river and the Old North Bridge upon discovering they were outnumbered when they saw the colonial militia coming down the hill towards them. By retreating across the bridge, they were able to put some distance between them and the colonials, forcing them to expose themselves to gunfire if they tried to cross the bridge. As the British continued to retreat, however, the home turf advantage once again comes into play. The British soldiers were already tired, having marched all the way to Concord, and now they had to retreat all that way back through villages that continued to gather more and more militiamen. Additionally, the British were restricted to the road, while the colonists took advantage of the countryside to fire upon the retreating British from the cover of fences and trees. It was these tactics that allowed the colonials to repulse the trained soldiers of the British Army in this opening salvo of the Revolutionary War. Next, we will turn our attention to the Battle of Saratoga, which is considered by many to be a pivotal battle, turning the tide of victory towards the colonists, in large part because the colonists' victory convinced the French to join the fight on their side. Saratoga was technically two battles fought 18 days apart. One factor that contributed significantly to Saratoga being the site of the battle was time. You see, British General John Burgoyne had just taken the highly strategic Fort Ticonderoga 71 miles to the north of Saratoga with relative ease, 
but did not pursue the colonists further at that time. In fact, it took him two months to attempt to head down to Albany as a part of his planned three-pronged attack on that city, giving the colonists much needed time to regroup and select a strategic location for their next encounter with Burgoyne. That location was Saratoga, and as with the fighting at Concord, the colonists took advantage of the high ground and a river. Knowing that Burgoyne would want to make use of the Hudson River to float supplies to his army, and that he would also want to take the relatively flat river road that ran beside the Hudson down to Albany, New York, which was an important city because of its accessible port on the river, and that the river road at Saratoga ran very closely alongside the Hudson, with Bemis Heights on the near side and some forested hills and ridges on the far, this was the perfect place to force the British army into a less advantageous position that they could not avoid if they wanted to make use of the river. Also, the delay in pursuit gave the colonists time to make some modifications and fortifications to enhance the natural defenses the area already had. Cannon placed atop the 300-foot-high Bemis Heights could shoot down to the river road and even reach the far side of the river. The American camp lay on the west side of Bemis Heights from the river, and so the colonists built walls across the northern and western edge of the camp and used Bemis Heights to protect the eastern side, essentially making the only unprotected side of the camp to the south. Additionally, they built strong fortifications along the flat floodplain beside the river, which pretty much forced any traffic coming down the river, or the river road, into the path of the cannons. Seeing what the Americans had set up, General Burgoyne tried to avoid the trap by sending a regiment to the west to attempt to take the high ground west of Bemis Heights, and one to the east, and one along the river bank. This first battle of Saratoga was fought at Freeman's Farm, and while the British won, it was at a great cost to them. American sharpshooters took out many British soldiers by making use of the cover of trees surrounding the battle to pick them off. Instead of pressing his advantage, slight though it was, Burgoyne hunkered down behind hastily erected redoubts and awaited reinforcements that never came, and supplies coming down the Hudson that instead had been captured by the Americans further north. Finally, Burgoyne decided to send a reconnaissance party to see if they could again attempt to capture the high ground west of Bemis Heights in order to dislodge the Americans. The Americans outnumbered them and quickly routed them, and defying orders to stay in his tent, General Benedict Arnold pushed the American advantage past the British redoubts and secured victory for the Americans. Burgoyne had no choice but to surrender, having lost 86% of his army. To some extent, it was Burgoyne's heavy reliance on the Hudson River for his supply line that contributed to his defeat. That reliance forced him to a specific route that allowed the colonists to anticipate his moves and allowed them to predict where and how they could cut off his crucial supplies. It was this much-needed defeat of the British at the hands of the colonists that convinced France and Spain to join with the American army, lending them their considerable support and resources. And now we turn our attention to the final battle of the American Revolution, Yorktown. It could be argued that geography was a deciding factor in the British defeat at the siege on Yorktown, more so than in any other revolutionary battle. You see, harbors are particularly important to battling armies. They provide access to ships that bring supplies, weapons, and reinforcements, and so military strategists will attempt to capture and hold these valuable geographical features, and it was for this very reason that British General Cornwallis had been commanded to take and hold Yorktown, Virginia, for the purpose of building a deep-water harbor on the York River, just up from where it empties into the Chesapeake Bay. But harbors also make the armies that hold them vulnerable to attack, and this was true for Yorktown, perhaps more so than any other. Yorktown is situated on a peninsula and is surrounded by water on three sides. Now this can be an advantage as you can easily see your enemy approaching, but in Cornwallis's case, it also meant you could be surrounded and your only avenue of escape cut off. Now, in a lovely bit of serendipity, the British chose Yorktown at about the same time that the French fleet was sailing to the lower Chesapeake Bay to establish a blockade. General George Washington had been intending to attack the British in New York City, another important harbor, but when he learned of the imminent arrival of the French Navy in the Chesapeake Bay, it seemed an opportunity too good to ignore. While continuing to lead the British to believe he was setting up for an attack on New York, Washington instead moved his army south to Williamsburg, Virginia, just 13 miles west of Yorktown. 
while American and French soldiers, dropped off by the French Navy, gathered in Williamsburg, the French fleet encountered the British fleet and easily defeated them, sending them running back to New York. This allowed the French Navy to effectively blockade Chesapeake Bay, cutting Yorktown off from supplies and help from the water. Hearing of the gathering army, Cornwallis had fortifications built in a defensive line around Yorktown. In this case, Cornwallis and the British held the slightly higher ground, and so the French and Americans dug ditches from which to bombard the British line, and used this to successfully take out most of the British guns. Then, under cover of darkness, the Americans dug a second, closer ditch, and captured two significant redoubts that allowed their guns to reach well inside the British fortifications. Surrounded and running desperately low on supplies and reinforcements too far away to be of any help, Cornwallis surrendered and so ended the American Revolution. While by no means assuring victory, knowledge of and the effective use of the physical geography of a region can still have a significant impact on the outcome, even allowing a smaller, less prepared army to defeat a larger one. Fortunately for the ragtag American army, our familiarity with our own home turf gave us just such an advantage. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Here are some links to some helpful resources as well as the works used in the creation of the screencast. <laughs>